Hello there. Time for us to do some cables and connectors. This video might not be as interesting or as fun as the previous ones or the following ones, but this is something we do have to do for Network Plus. So let's get into it. So first up, let's talk about Ethernet standards and how the naming convention works. Now first shock and horror is that Ethernet is a standard, not a cable. But we'll talk about that just now when we talk about the twisted pair cables. So the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, or the IEEE, define a lot of the OSI Layer 1 and Layer 2 standards. And you're going to see IEEE 802 dot something very often when it comes to networking. Now in particular, IEEE 802.3 identifies Ethernet. Now let me make it a bit easier for you to remember the 802 codes. The 802 bit comes from when the IEEE first started doing networking standards. The year was 1980, the month was February, 802. So all you have to worry about is the stuff that comes after the dot. The number will represent a particular type of networking standard, and the letters will usually represent amendments to the original standard. We'll see quite a bit of that when we do the Wi-Fi stuff with 802.11 because we've got quite a lot of letter amendments for that. Now, 802.3 defines a numbering slash naming convention that helps us identify both speed and media type for Ethernet compatible cables. And it's normally going to be written as something base something. Now, the word base is for base bandwidth frequency. It's an electrical slash electronic engineering term to deal with baseband frequencies, which is cool to know, but not necessary to know to deal with network administration and network cabling. The X is a speed, so it'll be a number usually. And if it's just a number, it's going to be in megabits per second, unless it's got like a G, for instance, to indicate gigabits per second. And then the thing at the end normally is there to indicate the kind of media we're dealing with. Now that media can be represented with some letters, Usually when it's the letter T, it means it's twisted pair. Might have some other letters as well, but if you see a T, you can be pretty confident it is twisted pair. If you see an F or any other letters, then T is not amongst them, it's probably fiber optic. If you see a number, then it's usually coaxial. And the number usually represents the hundreds of meters of length a single coaxial cable can go for. Now, Let's deal with coaxial first. First of all, let's look at the construction. A coaxial cable is a single conductor cable. There will be a central core conductor, around which will be an inner insulator, around which will be a metal shield, which is there for protecting from external sources of electromagnetic interference. And outside of that will be a plastic jacket to protect it all. So remember, this is a single conductor cable, which means that we can only send one signal at a time through it. So this supports what we call half duplex communications, where only one person who is on that LAN infrastructure with this cable can communicate. Everyone else connected has to listen to them. That is what we mean by half duplex communications. It's like those two way radios you can play with as kids. One person presses the button to talk, everyone else has to listen. Now, if it is a solid core cable, it is usually what we call 10 base 5, which means that it goes 10 megabits per second at half duplex and is up to 500 meters long. If the core conductor in the middle is stranded, in other words, it's a bunch of little wires twisted together, it is called 10 base 2 and gives you 10 megabits per second up to 180 meters, which is near enough to 2. So that's why they said 10 base 2. Now, a big advantage to the stranded core is that it's more flexible, easier to work with, which is why we are able to tolerate the shorter range of 180 meters. And this used to be a very, very popular LAN cabling media. So we used to use this quite a lot for Ethernet many, many years ago. And it's still around. It's used by cable TV providers who offer internet services through that. And it's also quite commonly used for antenna cabling, including satellite dishes. So you do still see it from time to time. 
But as far as modern LAN infrastructure is concerned, we don't really use this as our primary cable between computers and switches and routers and so forth. Now, in case you do deal with it, you've got a couple connector types that are quite popular for networking. You've got the F-type connector, which will have the core conductor sticking out. So when you're busy connecting this thing, you'll line that up properly before you start threading that nut. Because if you misalign it and damage that core conductor, you're going to have to re-terminate it. And I can guarantee you, you're going to use quite a few F-words like and then you've got the BNC connector, which is a little bit better to work with because the connector forces you to line it up properly before the core conductor is exposed to any sort of stress or force. It also has a very easy quarter turn locking and unlocking mechanism. So very nice for quick connect and quick disconnect. And then you have type N, which is similar to BNC in that it protects the conductor and the actual point where the data travels, but it does have a threaded nut for a more secure and physically tight connection. Now, coaxial out of the way, let's talk about twisted pair, or as most people might know it, an Ethernet cable. So let's check it out. It is the most common LAN cable that we use right now, and it does get called an Ethernet cable or a LAN cable. That's fine. The reason why it got called an Ethernet cable or a LAN cable is around the time the word Ethernet started entering people's vocabulary. This was becoming a very, very popular and widely utilized LAN cable. So you can see how this cable type and the term Ethernet became synonymous. But Ethernet is just going to describe how we do signaling and how we structure data to travel across LAN cables, regardless of what the cable is actually made of. Now, one of the main draw points is it's relatively cheap. I'm not going to say it is low cost, but it is a very cheap cable in regards to what it offers us. It gives us good speeds. It gives us good stability. It gives us good range gives us good flexibility to work with, it's ticking a lot of boxes that makes it very, very appealing for networking. The speed options, as I said, are good. You can get everything from 10 megabits per second up to 40 gigabits per second through it now. And it does support both half and full duplex. As we said earlier with the coaxial, half duplex is one person talks at a time, everyone else has to listen. With full duplex, you can send and receive at the same time, like a phone call with somebody. You can speak and they can speak at the same time and you will hear each other. Whether you'll understand each other and have an intelligible conversation, I don't know. But you can speak and hear at the same time. And the cable lengths are quite reasonable. 100 meters ideal is how far we can go between network devices with one of these cables. Now, I do say ideal because I want to point out that the real world is not ideal. And that means we're going to have imperfections in the cable, termination, environment, installation, etc. So usually it's a good practice to terminate the cable well before 100 meters. Personally, I chicken out at 90 meters. 9-0. And the wires have color-coded pairs inside. And the color-coded pairs are twisted together. The twisting is to try and eliminate crosstalk, where electricity is traveling through one wire creates a magnetic field and that magnetic field can induce electrical current in a nearby conductor but by twisting it together and sending an opposite signal through one of the two pairs of the wires that are twisted you can negate or cancel out the magnetic field and it can also aid in minimizing external interference as well which is why unshielded twisted pair is still pretty good even in an office environment when it runs near power cabling and light fixtures. Now, twisted pair cables come in what we call category standards or CAT standards. And the first one that was created was CAT1. We got one megabit per second, but it was mainly a telephone line. Early ethernet cables that were twisted pair based were basically telephone cables being repurposed to carry ethernet signals. Then CAT2 came along, offering us four megabits per second. And this was when we had digital telephone lines and that allowed for a little bit of a better performance there. Then came CAT3, which gave us 10 megabits per second, 100 meters max ideal, and we started calling that an Ethernet LAN cable. CAT4 was also a thing, offered us 16 megabits per second, and it was widely utilized by Token Ring. But in fairness, you don't need to know these four for Network Plus. They're a little bit legacy. I just put them there so that you can see where we came from. The lowest cat level that they want you to know for network plus 
is Cat5. Cat5 got the trade name Fast Ethernet. Bad choice in my opinion to call it that, but anyway. And it goes up to 100 megabits per second. They also brought out Cat5e. Slightly better cable that could push us up to 1000 megabits per second or a gigabit per second. Meant for residential networks and small businesses. And there's a little catch I want to tell you about later on, but there's a couple of other cables that have that same catch. So for now, just enjoy that asterisk. After Cat5e, we had Cat6. Also 1000 megabits per second, but it did it way better than Cat5e does. And we recommend that for up to a commercial LAN implementation. So think of your enterprise office environment. Now, as you can imagine, we wanted a slightly better version, so they brought out Cat6a. And then after a while, somebody said, hang on, why don't we call it Cat6e so that people can understand it is to Cat6 what Cat5e was to Cat5. So you'll sometimes see it labeled as Cat6a, sometimes you'll see it labeled as Cat6e, it's the same thing. It's a Cat6 cable that's made to a slightly better standard that can go up to 10 gigabits per second, but it doesn't do it as well as what comes next. But we can use it for medium scale data centers and core infrastructure in a small to medium business. Cat7, however, would be the better option to go for if you wanted a stable, guaranteed 10 gigabits per second most of the time. And we also have Cat8. Now there's actually two variations of Cat8, Cat8.1 and Cat8.2. Gotta love it when these standards start changing the naming convention just to confuse us, but anyway. Uh, Cat5 8.1 can go up to 25 gigabits per second, and Cat8.2 can go to 40 gigabits per second. However, they're limited to 30 meters due to the higher frequency and the cable experiencing greater attenuation with that higher frequency. Attenuation being the weakening of the electrical voltages, which means weaker signal strength. But we normally like to use it for data centers and core infrastructure that needs to be very high performing. Now my little asterisks here is just to indicate that these were not great at those speeds. They're okay, you will get there sort of, but not stably or consistently. That is why we have Cat6 doing 1000 megabits per second just like Cat5e, but Cat6 does it better, more consistently, more stably. It's the better option if you want a gigabit per second LAN. Now, in terms of your cable type, you get the first type, which is called unshielded twisted pair, UTP. Sort of looks like this. Eight little wires twisted together in four color-coded pairs. Then they'll all be in the same plastic jacket or insulator to keep them all together and keep them nice and snug and safe. The twisting will be a different number of twists per foot for each color pair. Good news is Network Plus is not going to ask you to say this many twists per foot or per meter, thankfully. But these twistings allow us to nearly completely eliminate the crosstalk that can occur between the wires when one is carrying an electrical signal and the other ones aren't. And the twisting also allows it to minimize on external interference, as long as it's not too significant. Anything that you find in an office or a residential environment should be no issue for this cable to ignore. Now, because of this simpler construction, it is very well priced and very easy to work with. But for situations where you're dealing with a lot of electrical noise and interference, you might be more interested in a shielded twisted pair. Still got eight wires with the same four color coding that we work with. And it includes shielding though. Usually it is some kind of metallic foil. You get FUTP which is where all eight wires are wrapped together in the same metallic foil with a grounding wire just to make it easier to connect to a shielded RJ45 connector. And you also get SFTP, where each pair is shielded and then there is a metal braid around all of them for shielding, similar to what's used in coaxial. This one offers even more immunity to external interference. But please, you must make sure you are using a shielded RJ45 connector, which I'll show you just now. If you don't use a shielded RJ45 connector, the metallic shielding has got nowhere to send the electricity that is induced by the interference. And that means the shielding is not really going to be doing its job properly. So please make sure you do spend the time and effort to put a proper shielded RJ45 connector here. But there are other kinds of shielding as well. These two I'm showing you here are the two more popular ones. But it does drastically reduce and even prevent a lot of external interference in noisy environments. 
Think of things like an industrial setting, a power plant, a factory, a mine, or even a medical facility where there might be very strong magnetic fields like near an MRI machine. This is where shielded twisted pair might be very useful. And lastly, we have something called a plenum and riser rated cable. So we've got plenum rated and we've got riser rated. And what happens is we install the plenum cable in the plenum spaces, which is a nice way of saying raised floors and suspended ceilings, anywhere where you can't see the cable. The riser cable is used between vertical spaces on a multi-story building to connect one floor to the next. And both of them are dealing with essentially the same thing. Fire resistance. Simple as that. And the main focus of the riser cable is to try and stop a fire spreading to the next floor of the building or the floor below. But plenum rated cables have the benefit of also being low toxicity. So plenum rated cables are very unlikely to catch fire. When they do, they're relatively likely to be self-extinguishing. And if they do burn, they will release very little toxins in the smoke which is obviously good. And this means that plenum rated cables usually meet higher fire safety standards. Whereas the riser cables are just less likely to catch fire, but if they do catch fire and burn, they're not as likely to self-extinguish. And, well, you're still burning plastic, so it's not going to be good for you. And it meets most standardized fire safety requirements for most municipal codes and regulations. The takeaway from this slide is basically... If you have to answer a question about plenum and riser cables, it's all to do with fire safety. Plenum is the better one and costs a little bit more. Riser is the cheaper one, but still good for fire safety. General rule of thumb is if the cable's running somewhere where you can't see it, that's where the concern is because a fire can then spread very easily without you knowing that cable is burning. But regardless of the kind of cable, we're going to use the same connector on them, RJ45 connectors. On the left, you have your plain, ordinary RJ45 connector. On the right, you have got the shielded one. You will note that the shielded one has a metal side to it and something for the shielding to be connected to. The metal side will allow the shielding to connect to the body of the network card, which is usually grounded on the computer or server's chassis. So any interference gets sent straight to Earth and doesn't cause any issues or much issues with the signals traveling through the wires that connect to those lovely little golden pins. Yes, those pins are real gold, but no, it's not enough gold to bother trying to extract. You'll probably spend more extracting that gold than you will from the actual value of it. Don't ask how I know. But this is where things get hectic now. With RJ45 connectors and Twisted Pair, you are going to be expected to be able to terminate and make your own cables, basically. So thankfully, we've got color patterns to work with. 568A and 568B are the two standardized patterns we tend to use the most. Now, when it comes to making off these cables, first of all, let's have a close look at how we need to identify stuff. So we have our RJ45 connector here with the hole at the bottom that the cable goes into. You've got your little plastic clip that latches it into the network card. That must be facing away from you. And the pins must be at the top, facing you. Pin number one is the leftmost pin. Then it's two, three, four, and pin number eight is the rightmost pin. Straightforward, right? And then you just have to remove any insulation, separate the twisted pairs, and get them into the correct order. You're going to have to pinch them between your fingers and possibly twist it back and forth just to try and undo a little bit of that twisting and tensile strength that makes the wires want to go back into that twisted state. You might even have to cut it to length. You'll slip them in, make sure all the wires go into the correct pin positions, and then crimp the connector onto the cable using a crimper. We'll talk about the tools that you would use towards the end of this video. Now, for those of you who have been looking at the color pattern, yes, you want to try and remember this because lately CompTIA has been asking people to remember this for their Network Plus exams. What I would suggest you do is you memorize one of the two patterns and then you just need to remember that the orange and the green pair are normally the pair that swap around to go from A to B or B to A. The brown and the blue pair usually stay where they are. Now, the reason for having two patterns is because if I use the same pin out or pattern on both sides of the cable, I've created something called a straight through cable. Generally using 5.6a on both ends of the cable to make a straight through is very popular in North America. 
and using the 568B pattern on both ends of the cable is very popular in Europe. Rest of the world, eh, it depends. But if you use the A pattern on one side and the B on the other, you have created what we call a crossover cable, where the orange and the green wires swap around on one side. Now let's understand why we would want to do that. So let's say we've got device type A that is following the MDI pinout, where pin 1 is positive transmission, pin 2 is negative transmission, pin 3 is positive receiving, and pin 6 is negative receiving. And then we've got device type B on the other side. It's an MDIX device. MDIX defines that pin 1 is RX positive, pin 2 is RX negative, pin 3 is TX positive, and pin 6 is TX ne negative. TX being transmit, RX being receive. If I use the 568B pattern on both sides, with the device on the left, I'll be connecting its transmitting pins to the device on the right's receiving pins using the orange pair. And I'll be connecting the device on the left's receiving pins to the device on the right's transmitting pins with the green pair. It's basically our device over here is putting its mouth next to this device's ears to whisper. And then to talk back, this device puts its mouth next to this device's ears. Fantastic. But if the next device in the network is also an MDIX device, that's why I called it device type B number two, and I try and use the 568 pattern on both sides, here's the problem. I've connected the receiving pair to the receiving pair and the transmitting pair to the transmitting pair. So these two devices have stuck their ears next to each other and can't hear a thing and then put their mouths next to each other and can't talk because they're busy kissing. This is obviously not what we want. We need to connect receiving pins to transmitting pins. So when device over here is the same as device over here as far as pinouts are concerned, both following the MDIX definition, we need to do what's called a crossover, where I use the B pattern on the one side and I cross over or swap over to the A pattern on the other side of the cable. Because the orange and the green pair swap around, what happens is receiving pins get connected to the transmitting pins on that device and the transmitting pins here get connected to the receiving pins here. So that's why we use the 568A pattern on one side and B on the other. This is creating a crossover cable to cross over the receive and transmit pins. Now I've got a bit of a general rule of thumb that works for when do you use straight through, when do you use crossover. The general rule of thumb is you use straight through for different types of devices, like for instance a PC to a switch, a switch to a router, or a wireless access point to a switch. Basically different types of devices. And then you use a crossover cable when it's the same type of device, like a PC straight to a PC, a switch to a switch, a router to a router. I do have one exception though. And that exception is when you're connecting a PC directly to an enterprise router. If your router looks something like this, that's the kind of router I'm talking about. Your small office, home office routers, LAN ports, are actually switch ports. So technically it would be switched to a PC. So you could use a straight through to your home router. But for an enterprise router like this, which is going to cost a lot of money compared to your home router, that is using the same pinouts that a PC uses. But here's the punchline. We also have this thing called Auto MDIX, where the ports on the network card of a device can work out what the neighboring device is and figure out does it need to do straight through or a crossover. And if it needs to do crossover, it can remap the pin functions from transmitting to receiving so that it's connecting to transmit or receive to the other device. So this actually ends up negating the need for us to do crossover cables nowadays. And it's present on relatively modern network appliances. So one of the things you'll want to do is just have a look at the device's features. And if you see Auto MDI or Auto MDIX, you can then just go straight through for everything and not have to worry about crossover cables. Can't wait till that becomes just the normal rule forever. The only warning I want to give you, though, is enterprise network appliances can keep going for a really really long time. Now there's another kind of cable I want to tell you about with Twisted Pair called a rollover cable. This is used for console connections 
where I can use an RJ45 connector plugged into my laptop and plug the other RJ45 connector into the console port of a network appliance to locally access its command line interface. The alternative is to use an RS-232 to RJ45 connector and the problem is those cables that have RS-232 on one side, the old serial communication port, and RJ45 on the other are quite rare. Add to that as well, most computers don't have those serial ports anymore so it actually need a USB to RS-232 adapter and then the RS-232 to RJ45. Uh. So it's better to have a rollover cable because you're more likely to have an RJ45 connector on your laptop. And if you don't, you can always get a USB to Ethernet adapter, and trust me, those things are actually always useful to have laying around. So how would I make one if I don't have a already produced rollover cable? Well, pick 568A or B, put that on the one end of the cable, and then on the other end of the cable, flip it around. Whatever was pin 1 on the one side becomes pin 8 on the other. 2 becomes 7, 3 becomes 6, 4 becomes 5, 5 becomes 4, 6 becomes 3, 7 becomes 2, 8 becomes 1. It rolls over. Do yourself a favor and just indicate somehow that this cable is not a standard LAN cable. I normally take some insulation tape and go crazy around both ends of the cable. And obviously because I make this relatively short when I make it for myself, I often go all the way from the one end to the other end with insulation tape and I know when I see that, that's not a normal LAN cable. And normally when somebody else sees it, they ask me, what gives with the insulation tape? And I tell them, that's because it's a rollover cable, not a data cable. It won't work for communications, it only works for accessing the command line interface of a network appliance through its console port. Now, let's move on to fiber. Or fiber if you prefer the British pronunciation. Now, fiber optic cables have some interesting, crazy construction, but the basic fundamental components that will be present regardless of how the cable is made is you will have your optical core in the middle. Now, it is not made of glass, despite popular urban legend. It's actually a silicon plastic composite, and obviously because silicone or silicon is glass, you can see where it came from. But it's more of a plastic, so it is flexible to an extent. Usually, the various types of fiber optic cable will come with some sort of degrees per meter or degrees per foot that you can bend the cable by without damaging the core in the middle. Now, the core is there to carry light through the cable. But the problem with light is it travels in a straight line, and if there's a bend in the cable, we might have that light not carry on down the cable. So around the core is something called cladding. It's a type of reflective material that will bounce light back into the core of the cable. And also it acts as a bit of a lubricant as well to protect the core from abrasion of the outer layers. Speaking of, you've got a coating to protect the cladding and also keep it all safe and dry. Then to keep it all extra safe, we normally have some strengthening fibers to make the cable more damage resistant and also resist bending too far past the degrees per meter or foot rating that the cable comes with. And lastly, we have the outer jacket to protect all of this good stuff. Now that is the basic construction of a fiber optic cable, but it can vary a little bit. It could include, for example, multiple core cladding coating layers to create a multi-strand fiber optic cable. It also may include a layer or strand of copper for power delivery, and this is very popular for WAN cables, especially the undersea cables used to interconnect the continents together so that the optical repeaters can receive power from shore instead of having to try and generate power in the middle of the ocean. Now, fiber optic cables come with two main varieties, single mode and multi-mode. Now, there'll be loads of individual types of cables that fall under these two categories, but these are the two big ones. So let's do it, single mode and multi-mode fiber. So single mode fiber has between an 8 and a 10 micron core, whereas multi-mode has a 50 to 60 micron core. Now the thing is microns are very small units of measurement. So the takeaway here is that the single mode fiber has a smaller optical core and the multi-mode core is larger. With a smaller core, that means we have more and better cladding being used on a single mode fiber. Multi-mode uses less cladding that is of an inferior quality. It's not dreadful, but it's not as good. 
This means that single mode fiber usually has a much neater, cleaner reflection of light, whereas multi mode, the light doesn't reflect nearly as well. Also, it carries between a 1310 and 1550 nanometer wavelength of light, whereas multi mode can only go up to about 1300 nanometers. Which sounds all really cool, but basically it just means that single mode fiber can use a freaking laser as the emitter. Whereas the multi-mode fiber uses an ordinary diode to generate the light. Single mode fiber is obviously more expensive with all these cool things coming along. And multi-mode is obviously cheaper with all of these compromises it's making. But the single mode fiber basically just works better at longer distances, making it suitable for WAN links. Whereas the cheaper yet still decent nature of multi-mode allows it to be fine for shorter distances without costing an arm and a leg, making it pretty suitable for land connections and possibly the last stretch, or as we call it, the last mile to the customer premises if you are a fiber optic ISP. Now, these are the recognized fiber optic standards for Ethernet. You've got 100 base FX, 100 base SX, surprise, surprise, 100 megabits per second, they're both multi-mode fiber running OM1 and OM2 in the case of SX. 1000 base SX and 1000 base LX will use multi-mode fiber again, OM2, 3, and OS1 and 2 cables are recognized for this. You also get 10G base SR and 10G base LR, which gives us 10 gigabits per second. The 10G base SR is multi-mode, whereas the 10G base LR is single-mode fiber. You might want to try and remember those letters and the multi-mode, single-mode nature of those cables for the exam. But if you can't, don't beat yourself up over it. As long as you recognize that they are fiber, you should be fine. And remember, the characters at the end tell you T or the letter T anywhere, it is twisted pair. If you see anything else, it's usually fiber. But if it's a number, it's coaxial. And you should be good to go. And then, to make us even more frustrated, fiber optic cables come with a variety of connectors. We have got the SC connector, or the subscriber connector over here. Nice little square connector. That's how I remember it. Then we have the LC connector, or the Lucent connector. Usually we implement them in pairs, and then we can use one for sending, one for receiving. And what's quite cool is they're very small. They're not much bigger than an RJ45 connector as a pair. So our fiber optic capable switches don't have to be like super big or small to handle these. And then we have our straight tip connector, which is sort of like the F-type connector, except it's usually got a nice metal connector that's very, very easy to turn. And then there's also the MTRJ or mechanical transfer registered jack where the pair of wires is in a single connector. Now what's quite cool is you will also get these little adapters that we'll talk about at another point in the series called Small Form Factor Pluggable Interfaces or SFP, which allows you to actually add either more RJ45 connectors or one of these fiber connection standards to an enterprise switch. You also get SFP Plus, which goes 10 gigabits per second or faster, but we'll talk more about that when we do the other topics in the course. Now it's time for us to look at the tools we use to do the cabling. So obviously you're going to have to cut your cables to length at some point. So you need a decent pair of cutters. Either some side cutters or cable cutters, either one is a good option. I tend to prefer these because they do a very nice clean cut that doesn't compress or do too much to the little eight wires in the middle. But if you don't have access to a nice pair of wire cutters that are like shears, you can just use an ordinary pair of side cutters. They will do the job just as well. Just try and make sure you keep them sharp, otherwise you end up with some bad cuts. Now, after that, you want to get some strippers. Not that kind of stripper, the kind that helps you get the insulation off without damaging the wires inside. I personally have a soft spot for this one because it's very cheap, very simple, and all I do is I just push the wire in there, and then I spin it around normally about two or three times, and it will cut just enough to get the outer jacket cut, pull it off without damaging or cutting into the inner wires. Bit of practice and you'll get it perfect, I promise. This one is spring-loaded and has a little dial that you can use to adjust how much it closes by, but I still have a soft spot for this one. It's quite cheap. And also, that little tooth over there can be used as a punch-down tool, which we'll talk about just now. 
Then once you've got your RJ45 connector on your eight wires, you need to crimp that RJ45 connector onto those wires. And here is your ordinary crimper. You slot in the RJ45 connector with the wire. You give the handles a good squeeze till you get a satisfying clack and it won't go anymore. And then you release and you should have, ideally, a well-terminated network cable. But sometimes you need to terminate your network cables in a different way. So we get this thing called a punch-down tool. And what we do is we use it to push the individual wires into connectors for wall sockets or patch panels. What's quite cool about the punch-down tool, like this one, is it's got a spring-loaded ratchet in it. So when you're applying pressure, at some point the spring-loaded ratchet gives way. The thing just goes clack and shoot, shoots down a bit. But when that happens, it won't push the wire anymore. So you shouldn't end up damaging or cutting the wire. It'll be making perfect electrical contact with the connectors on a patch panel or a wall block. Now these patch panels, we usually use them in network cabinets and server racks and stuff like that for organized cabling. So that I don't have to run one length of cable all the way to the switch or the server or whatever. I can run a little stretch from the device in the cabinet to this, uh, do a plenum or riser cable from the back of this to a wall connector, and then a, another length of cable from the wall connector to the person's computer, or if it's an access point in the ceiling, to the access point in the ceiling. Now on the back side, that is where the punch down tool comes in, because we will separate the individual little wires like that guy has done over here. I'm assuming this is a man's hand, and you push the wires down into the receptacles and the punch down tool will give way just as it's making perfect contact. And then you're on your way to making a very neat and tidy looking network cabinet or server rack. But you better make sure your cables are working before you get too carried away with yourself. So you want to make sure you've got a cable tester on hand as well. Now this is a cheap and cheerful cable tester. I have a couple of these laying around. They are not expensive at all. They take a battery you plug one end of the cable into the master, another end of the cable into the remote, same cable obviously, you turn it on. And what happens is the lights turn on in sequence and you should see the same lights lighting up on both sides. If some of them swap places, like for example one and seven, you definitely got a problem. If you see one and three, that's fine, you did a crossover. But if you see wrong crossing, obviously you made a mistake. And obviously if one of them doesn't light up, you didn't push that wire in enough before you crimped. Better cut that connector off and re-terminate it. But very, very helpful little filler. This one, on the other hand, is what we call a cable tester certifier or time domain reflectometer. It does way more advanced tests on a network cable, making sure it meets with certain wiring standards that might be necessary for certain kinds of implementations. It is also able to check the length of the cable, quality of the signal, and if there's a fault in the cable, it could even tell you how far down the cable the fault is. Very, very cool tool. Downside is, though, they're kind of expensive. Then you also get toner probes. Some people call these fox and hounds. What happens is, if you don't know where the other end of the cable is, you put the generator, or the tone generator, also referred to as the fox, on the cut side of the cable that you want to find the other end of. You go to where you think the other end is and you put the probe or the hound on it and you run the little pointy bit there on all of the conductive connectors. And when you hear a noise come from this probe, you know you have found the other end of the cable. Yeah, it is that simple. Then you get a couple of other interesting tools that will help you for coaxial. The tools are not likely to be used in a modern LAN, but they're not too difficult to work with. And if you have to deal with fiber optic cables, that is a bit beyond the scope of Network Plus to actually worry about working with those physically. Um, you're going to require specialist tools and specialist training to properly terminate or splice together cables. So either you are going to go on that specialist training where you'll get access to the tools and all of that stuff and some hands-on experience, or you will contact a specialist to come and do that for you. They're quick and they're efficient and they do a 10 times better job. Because the thing is, you are melting an optical core together in a way that does not interfere with the transmission of light. That's a lot harder than just making electrical contact. So don't be arrogant, call a specialist or become that specialist. 
Otherwise though, that should cover most of what you need to know for cabling and connectors. I'd like to thank you all for watching. I really appreciate it. And if you have any friends or family members, colleagues, peers, or anybody that you know that would be interested in learning Network Plus, don't be afraid to share this video with them. And if you haven't already done so, don't forget to subscribe. Otherwise, though, I'll catch you in the next video.